Welcome everyone. We are thrilled you are here today and I am particularly thrilled um, to be introducing our, our very own author speaker this afternoon um, with you all. I'm Mary Matisse and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Mission Hospice and Home Care and I started with Mission um, as a Community Education Manager and um, love the education events that Mission Hospice has been committed to offering our community since its inception over 40 years ago. Um, uh, the program has grown in leaps and bounds and many thanks to Susan Barber, um, I think who initially uh, reached out and, and set this date up with Gabby knowing that she was writing another book and we are thrilled to be able to have Gabby um, do her book launch with us all today. Um, so for any of you who may not know, Mission Hospice and Home Care is a nonprofit community-based hospice that's been serving San Mateo and Santa Clara counties for more than 40 years now. Um, and we, as part of our mission, have been including community education, events of speakers, movies, um, specific education on hospice and end-of-life conversations um, for quite some time and are thrilled to have one of our very own tonight, um, or today, um, Gabby Elise Jimenez to join us with her wisdom as a hospice nurse, as an end of life doula. Um, Gabby is, um, as I mentioned, a hospice nurse with Mission Hospice, an end of life doula and a conscious dying educator. She also has a blog, www.hospiceheart.net and a Facebook following that is off the chart. So um, after today, if you're not already following Gabby, please do. Um, and uh, we were just having a, a pre-event conversation um, that was really warm and wonderful about the topic of this book. Um, and the book, I'm going to just give read you the bio uh, or about the book. Gabby's new book invites you into the heart of a hospice nurse and end of life doula. For every patient visit, she brings with her a collection of tools that she has acquired over the years, hoping to ensure that someone who is dying finds peace and comfort. What she soon realized that was that when she left at the end of each visit, she took her tools with her, leaving families and loved ones nervous and sometimes scared about the care they would provide on their own. At every patient visit, she now hands over her tips and tools to the families, caregivers, and volunteers so that they can feel more confident providing end-of-life care. If you are sitting at the bedside with someone who is dying, this book is for you. So Gabby, thrilled to have you join us this afternoon. And um, for all of your fans, new and old, um, I just wanted to welcome you and also kick this off with a couple of questions. Um, and the first one is, you've written two other books. What, what really was your inspiration for this one? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. You know, I've got a big soft spot for mission. Um, so this book in particular is, you know, when I first became a hospice nurse, I would go into the home or at the bedside of a patient who was dying, and I would share with them some of my skills and tools that I had been, you know, handed over to me and in helping them to create a sort of a safe and comfort, comfortable area for this person, right? And, and then I would leave. And then they would call and they would ask questions. And, and then I would, I would call them back and I would say, oh, well, do this, do that. And I always felt like I was sort of hoarding my stuff, these wonderful lessons that I had been um, given by doctors and other nurses and team members that I have worked with over the years. And I felt like a hoarder, like a, a hospice tool hoarder. <laughs> I didn't want to do that anymore. And, um, and so what I wanted to do was to be able to hand them over to caregivers, to volunteers, to family members, so that they could do this work. So I started when I would go into a home and I would sit next to the bed, I would share these tools with whomever is at the bedside because at the end of the day, I truly believe that you do not have to have a license to provide end of life care. 
And, and while I'm there as often and, and as long as I possibly can be, sometimes the moments of, of most fear or most panic or, or symptoms exacerbate huge, they are alone with this person and they don't know what to do. And I was not feeling comfortable with that. So I wrote this book with the idea that it would be a, a guidebook for anyone who sits at the bedside and, and throughout the book, and I'll read a couple pages of, of some things that I think stand out, but the last, I think, six pages are all my tools, all the little tips that I use, the things that I have learned. And, you know, the truth is I make them up as I go, but, but if they work and if they bring comfort and then I... I want to give them to you so you too can do them. And, and well, I think medication is important. I think we should always have it in place. I, as most people know who have ever heard me speak, it is not my first go-to and I'm not a big fan of going to that first. I want to relieve symptoms by offering sort of, I guess the five senses, right? Touch and, and verbal tactile stimuli and maybe moistening the mouth or loosening the covers or just simply reaching over and saying, I've got you. What if those things brought comfort first? What if those tools, those, those little bits of, of things that any of us can do could relieve someone, then that would be my goal. So my book, it's only 80 pages. It's a super easy read. Um, it's, it's a handbook. Fantastic. And, and I know people are now going to be jumping to want to read those six pages at the end, but the, the, the reality is that they've been born from your stories, from your experiences and from what you found work. So I, we're just jumping right in Gabby, but I'm just wondering, do you, do you have a couple stories you want to share that would give people examples of, of how what you've just said makes a difference for people? So I'll give, I, I do have some stories that I, I might read from the book just so I could give you a little teaser. Um, but you know, I'm gonna give you a really good example. You walk in and you see this person is lying, lying in this bed and he is dying and dying is not easy. It's hard work and, and there's a lot of things going on and especially if this person is non-responsive and doesn't have a voice, you are their voice. So I am not a big fan of um, vital signs because I don't think they always truly equate to what that person is, is going through. So I, I visually assess, I, I look at their eyes, their skin, their hands, the way their body is moving, the, the, just the different way they're positioned and everything about them. I look at everything and I see what can I do. Well, a lot of times a patient will have some agitation and it's, it's almost automatic. Oh, we'll give them some lorazepam for instance, because it works. But what if, this is just an example, what if their mouth was really dry and they couldn't tell you, right? And you said, hey, I got it. And you got a little syringe, a needleless syringe, and you put just a little bit of water. You let them know first because this is their experience and you don't ever just touch someone or move someone or do anything to anyone without giving them a heads up whether they have a voice or not. And you say, I'm just gonna put a little drop of water on your tongue. And you put that little drop of water on their tongue and suddenly there is this sort of, because that's all they really needed. Of course, they're agitated, their mouth is dry or their arms are crunched under them or their arms are heavy. What if you elevate them a little bit and make them a little more comfortable? Or what if you loosen up the, the blankets around their toes that are so tight they can barely move? There are things that all of us can do that could improve the way we care for someone who is dying. They deserve that. I think all humans deserve that. And these are things that we can do. Um, Fantastic. Sorry. Yeah, know. please, please. Okay. Let's see here. I put, I kind of, uh, um, let's see, which one do I wanna read you? Okay, this one, it's, it's just a blog that I wrote. It's called Packing My Memories to Go. Just before that last breath is taken, I encourage those who are about to say goodbye to share some favorite memories. Not necessarily with me, although I always enjoy that, but more for the person they love to be able to take with them when they go. It is in these moments where I am gifted glimpses of their life, windows that have been opened just enough for me to peek inside. And I love this so much, but it feels like such a tease, always leaving me wanting more. 
When I was a young girl, I created stories in my head of a life I dreamt of having. They were filled with magic, music, and dancing. And I lived in fancy houses with lots of rooms that I could invite all of my fabulous friends to come over and play in. My fantasy life kept me moving forward during these times I felt were darkest, and I clung onto them like a safety net. And as I grew older, I found myself doing the same for people I would casually meet, creating a life they may or may not have had. And now as an adult, when I am not gifted the stories from people at the bedside and the person I am with is dying alone, I imagine the life they might have had. And it comforts me to assume they were not always alone and instead lived a full and happy life. Unfortunately, I know that this is not always the truth, truth which saddens me. And that is why I encourage memory sharing at the bedside. It feels to me like they are sending someone they love off with a beautifully wrapped package of the moments they shared together. This gets to be their takeaway. And in my mind, which is always creating magic and fantasy, I imagine them collecting the memories that have just been shared and thinking to themselves, hmm, and packing my memories to go. And this makes me smile inside. As I was writing this particular blog, having the title already planted firmly in my head, I was sent a poem by my new friend Courtney, and the first part of it goes like this. I looked for you when I came in, and when I saw you, something had changed. I knew in my heart, without any doubt, you were packing your memories to go, and I smiled. This morning, I sat at the bedside with a son and his wife who had just said goodbye to his mother. After she took that last breath, he told me that he had imagined her on a big cruise ship heading out for another journey. Perhaps she was going to sail around the world, which made him feel better about having to say goodbye. He shared that of all of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren had come to say their goodbyes recently, filling her heads, hands with kisses and telling her to take them with her when she goes. He said he had known for days she was ready, but wasn't sure what she was waiting for. I smiled and I said, it sounds like she's been packing her memories ready to go, but he was, but she was waiting for the kisses before she could leave. He smiled and said, I like the thought of that. I'm absolutely certain I will continue to create a lifetime of adventures that may or may not have ever happened for those I'm holding space for as they are dying. But if they are blessed to have you at their bedside and you have a memory or two to share, give them something extra to pack in their to-go box. Oh, Gabby, that's beautiful. You know, I, I always think this is this is their only chance to do this. We don't, you know, we don't get a do-over with death. So how can we, any of us who are sitting at the bedside, how can we make their experience a, a little, their landing a little softer, but also those who are going to say goodbye, how can we give them a takeaway that allows them to feel as though they did something to help make the, the difficulties less. So whether I hand them the tools or I ask them to share memories or share stories or, or whisper special words, I, I always want that those last moments for, for the person dying and the person to say goodbye, that they, they have a takeaway in their heart that they did everything that they could and that they contributed it to providing peace. And that's really important to me. That's beautiful. And, and I, I know with the people whose videos are on on this call, there's, there's a lot of memories going through people's minds of experiences that they've had in their own stories with, with family members or even patients. And, and, and I'm wondering, um, although we were, we were talking before the, the call started about kind of being a Pollyanna, um, and, and, and the, the positive visions that you hold for people, which are beautiful. And as you even wrote, not always the true story that people have lived. And I'm just curious when you have families, um, people who are dying and those around them that may not have had the easiest relationships, how are, have some of the tools or what are the experiences you've had at the bedside of, um, something that may have shifted that or, I know you've had these, um, uh, or the difference it makes when people are able to help pack that, that bag of memories before someone leaves. You know, I think that people, um, people want to believe that the dying process is always beautiful and good, and, but there's, there's struggle and there's difficulties, and it's not always on the, the side of the patient. It, it tends to be with the families, those that are sitting at the bedside. There's disconnect with siblings. There's 
there's resentment, there's regret, there's all this stuff that at that moment at that bedside, there is so much angst that it it's an energy that we all feel. And so I find myself trying to ease that somehow. And, and I don't mince words at the bedside. I'm, I'm very honest. And sometimes I will say to the family who's arguing over the bedside, you know, I get it, you guys. I, I have been where you are, but is this really the last thing you want your mom to hear? Because I believe that they hear everything. And if that's the case, do you really want her to, to hear that? Because I think what she needs to know, especially a mother, a mother needs to know her kids are going to be okay. Her mother needs to know that, that she did a good job. Those are the things that you want to say. But I did have a, a, a family. I walked into this home. I had never met their mother who was, was in the other room. And, um, and it was three siblings. And they were arguing. I mean, from the minute I walked in, they were there was two couches and a chair. And they were as far away from one another as they possibly could be. And I, um, I could feel the disconnect and they were one upping each other with who was providing better care and who wasn't and which I see often. And so I went and I checked on the mother and, and she was peaceful. She was well cared for. You could see she was clean. She was in her cozy bed. She had beautiful music playing. The scene itself um, was, was what I would hope for, but the energy wasn't there. So, and you'll probably laugh. Some of you have heard this story before. I'm like the, the hospice MacGyver. So I went out to my car and I got some embroidery thread. I got three strands of embroidery thread, different colors. And I brought them in and I gave each one of them one and I cut them in half. So they each had two pieces. And I said, here's what I want you guys to do. I want you to take turns one at a time and you go in with your mom and tie one strand to your mother's wrist. And, and tie it with four knots. And with each of those knots, you can send her with a prayer. You can send her with a wish of comfort on her journey. You can tell her the gifts that she's left for you, the things that you will take away, but give her four things that she can take with her. And when you come back out, then your, your sibling will go in. So they all three did that. And they had a moment, they each tied this to her wrist, they came back. And when they came back, interestingly enough, they all ended up on the same couch, which I thought was kind of, kind of lovely. So they looked at me with this sort of deer in the headlights look, so what next? And I said, now I want you to help each other by tying the strings on each other's wrists so that the colored string that you had, for instance, to one of the daughters, I said, yours is red. You know, you're the one you put on your mother is red. So let's tie a red one to your wrist. And I had her siblings help her and they tied it and I gave each of them two of the knots. So they too had to do four knots on her, but two of them were going to give her some sort of prayer or some sort of wish, uh, wish for strength and comfort as she navigates the loss of their mother. And, and I watched as they did this. And, and when they were done, when all three had done, they kind of did this group hug where they cried and they were, they were on this same page. And so I said, okay, you guys, I'm going to leave now, but it's really important that your mom know that you are going to take care of one another, that you are going to stay in contact, that you are not going to disconnect. She needs to go with that in her heart. So I left, I went and I saw their patients and I read in the chart that day that she had passed away that night. Well, about 30 days later, the son had called me and said, hey, Gabby, I just wanted to let you know my string came off today which made me happy that he kept it on. <laughs> I, said, I said, so how did that feel? And he goes, well, I was sad because I've been playing with it, you know, for all this time. And it was my connection to my mom, but it was so comforting to have it there. And I said, okay, well, that's good. I said, what are you going to do with it? And he said, I'm going to put it in a box and I'm going to save it. And I said, okay. And I said, let me ask you something. How are things going with your sisters? And he said, Gabby, we have dinner every Sunday just like oh. So I think that there is disconnect and there is struggle and death is hard and dying is hard and losing someone you love is hard. But if you are at the bedside of someone who is about to die, I think it is our responsibility 
to do whatever we can to ensure their comfort. And if someone is, is about to say goodbye to someone that is dying, I think it's our responsibility to ensure that they do not do this alone and that neither of them ever feel like they are alone. And there's ways we can do that, which is just as simple as reaching over, touching their hands and saying, I've got you. Wonderful. And, and, and you're sharing this so beautifully through your stories. And to me, you've already said it, but I'm, I'm curious if there's more you want to say about why you're so passionate about having more people engage in this way around end of life care. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's funny, I, I don't think I've ever said this out loud. Um, and it's made me incredibly emotional, which surprise that part doesn't surprise me. Everyone who knows me knows that I'm going to cry easily. Um, when my mom and dad died, I was there for both of them. We did not have a good relationship. We were not close. I had no experience with death and dying. I didn't even know what I was supposed to do. So many things I would have done different if I knew then what I know now. But what I regret most is not saying the things, not being fully present for them, not for at the very least, if I couldn't thank them for a life, you know, that was wonderful or for parents that were wonderful, which at the time I, I didn't have that in me, but at the very least to thank them for life and to wish them well and to, um, to just have a journey that is safe. Um, I, I regret not having that. And you don't ever forget that. That doesn't go away. And 30 years later, I strive to make sure that no one ever feels that regret despite whatever their relationship was. We, we need to be able to say goodbye and, and, and hopefully thank you, you know, and I love you and I'll miss you, but at the very least to say goodbye because that is closure and I didn't have that. And so maybe that's the drive behind my um, intense desire to ensure that everyone has a better last memory. Um, I, I just don't want anyone to ever feel that way. And I think that there's ways that we can help make sure that doesn't happen. I personally believe you're right. And also for your, your personal um, challenges around that experience, the, the gift of it has been that you now teach and share with so many. Um, to shift that for them and for their future. And um, I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, certainly, I think we all believe it, at Mission Hospice uh, that the death is more than physical and that we make a difference both for the person who's dying, but for those who live on and will then experience what they take away from that, um, from that experience. And, and those tools and that uh, message is, um, a resounding need in our society and people are often surprised that it comes through the lens of death versus <laughs> everything else that um that it can be so uh healing mm. the experience yeah. around dying can be so healing so give us another tool gabby give us give us some more yummy of your experiences well i have i have a couple things you know can i read a poem first Absolutely, please. So I wrote this for a lovely woman who I was blessed to spend some time with at the bedside. She might be on here today. I wrote this for her because she was grieving the loss of a man that she loved deeply. And um, I, I wanted to not fix her, but I, I wanted to help her somehow. And, and I'm hoping that my presence did, but I I wrote this poem for her. If I could hug your heart. If I could hug your heart, I'll tell you what I'd do. I would squeeze it just enough to take the pain from you. I'd put it in a jar and tightly close the top. I would tell it that it's not welcome here and I'd ask it just to stop. I know that things are hard for you. I see it in your face. The struggle and the ache you feel is taking up your space. It needs to be worked through though, and it will take some time. Until you are ready for that, please put your hand in mine. I will sit right here beside you. I'll listen to everything you say. 
I'll comfort and support you. I'll show up and I'll, I will stay. That is what someone needs when they are grieving and feeling pain. Their lives have changed forever. They will never be the same. One day that jar can open. No, I will be right by your side. I'll hand you all the tissues until your eyes have dried. The jar may never empty. The pain won't go away, but your heart will fill back up again and all the memories you shared will stay. I think we need tissues all around. I, I, you know, at a Zoom webinar, how do we pass tissues around? But you're all doing that yourselves. So thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Um, I, I have a page I'm going to read. I, it's just a, um, it, it's in this particular one, it's called Sometimes. And, um, and it, it's, it's a blog, but I think it's a good one. When I walk into the room of a patient, I always remember that this isn't about me and that every situation will be different, therefore never assuming anything and always being prepared for everything. Sometimes there will be a large crowd of family and friends, which can be overwhelming and can throw me off a bit. I have learned to work the room, which means I assess each person, watching their facial expressions and mannerisms as I try to find the one who might need my support the most. I will go to that person, sit down next to them and ask if they have any questions or there is anything I can do for them. Sometimes I'm spot on and this person welcomes the support and other times they don't need anything at all for me and would prefer not to talk and I respect that. Sometimes I just take a step back and I make myself available, but I don't get in their way. I know that they know this person better than I do and their situation is not about me. So I do not get to tell them how they should be around them, but I do let them know I am there. I guide them if needed. I applaud them for the beautiful care they are providing. And I educate them about what to expect and what to be prepared for. Sometimes there's only one person at the bedside. And when I walk into the room, I see tear stained eyes and a body that is hunched over the bed from both physical and emotional exhaustion. And my first reaction is to comfort them, which is what I do. As long as my patient is not struggling in some way and there are no immediate symptoms which I need to try and resolve, the person I want to offer comfort and support to is the one who is struggling with saying goodbye. Sometimes I walk into the room and no one is there except for the person who is dying and they are dying alone. I always assume they hear me, so I tell them who I am and why I'm there. I sit down next to their bed. I ask them if I can take their hand. And if they do not respond, I gently put their hand in mine and I sit in silence for a moment. This is their room, this is their body, and this is their experience. My only role is to let them know they are not alone. I might see photos of their life on a table next to the bed, which indicates to me they once had a family and friends and made memories. Sometimes I see an empty table and I feel a sense of sadness in my heart. Regardless of what I see or don't see, I sit quietly at their bed, bedside being fully present for them and honoring their life at their death because I believe all humans deserve that. Sometimes people die alone. Sometimes they are surrounded by a group of people who love them fiercely. Sometimes there is struggle. Sometimes there is peace. Sometimes there is laughter and sometimes there are tears. This work we do can be beautiful, but it can also be difficult. Sometimes we can hold the tears in. Sometimes there are none. And sometimes we sit in our car afterwards and we sob. Sometimes our tears are about the family we just watched say goodbye. Sometimes it is the reminder of someone we once lost. And sometimes it is simply about a death and the fact that every single day we are reminded about how truly fragile and precious life is and that alone, that, and that alone can bring a tear to our eye. This work is not about us. We are not here to fix anything or change the dynamics of years worth of disconnect. We cannot somehow magically bring people together or bandage brokenness. We cannot tell a person how to grieve or how to feel when someone they love is dying. Our role is to be fully present and hold space for them in any way that is needed without judgment, personal comment, or deflecting from their experience and making it about us. But when that last breath has been taken and the hush I have heard a million times fills the room, I take in a deep breath and I try really hard to hold in my tears. And even though I know this is not about me, Sometimes I cry. Hmm. It's Capture so work. much. Sorry. It's not easy work. It is not easy work. And I, 
I honor the work and I, for those who are on this, um, this session this evening or this afternoon um, who do the work, for those who have been at the bedside of a loved one, for those who may be living this experience right now. Um, I know that self-care is one of your passions as well, to be able to do this work and to be able to be as present as you speak so eloquently about. So can you say a bit about the importance of self-care or what that even means in this work? Self-care is so important. And um, I was reminded during COVID um, how much I was not doing that for myself. I, um, it was so incredibly hard during that time that I, I felt broken and I would come home and I would crawl under my covers and I would hide and I would cry because it was so hard and I didn't take care of myself and the weight was so heavy. And then I would get up every morning and do it all over again. And, um, and that took its toll on me. And what I realized was that whether you are providing care to someone who is dying, whether you, it is you, this is someone who is in your family, someone that you love, however you are providing support to someone who is dying or someone who is grieving, that is a, a, a weight that we wear. And, and regardless of how strong we are or might appear, we wear it. And those of you who have cared for someone you love, you know what that feels like. It's like, I've described this before as a, a, a jacket with many pockets, each one filled with sand. And so you have this beautiful jacket and even the pockets are really nice, but underneath is the sand that makes it so heavy. And you know that you can pour those pockets out and you can empty that sound, but somehow you're so connected to it and so stuck to it that you can't. And what that does is that just keeps weighting you down until you fall to the ground and you have to find a way not to do that. So I, I do a couple things very consistently. One is I go outside and I breathe fresh air. Um, the sky is one of my favorite places. So I just look up at that sky and I just soak it all in and I ask it for some sort of guidance and support. And, and, and I have a, a grief bowl, which you might have heard me share before. It's a bowl. I collect hearts. So it has crystal hearts. It has rock hearts. It has wooden hearts. It has pewter hearts. It's got painted hearts. It's, it's very beautiful. And, um, and it's filled with all these wonderful hearts. Well, what I do is I take this bowl that is filled with all of my wonderful hearts and I put it out on a table and I pick up each heart one at a time. And I think about the person I was with that day. I think about the people who were saying goodbye. I think of why and how it affected me. What, what was it that grabbed hold of my heart so hard? And, and I think about the lessons where there's so many, we, we learn so much every day from the people that we provide care for and support. And so I count my blessings, I count my lessons, I, I think about each person and I honor them with each heart. And then I scoop up all of the hearts and I hold them in my hand and I just say, um, you know, I, I honor you in a huge way and I put them back in the bowl. And then I just take a deep breath because breathing is so important. And I'm learning to meditate, but you have to do this every day. It's not something you can say, I'll do that on Tuesdays. No, you have to do it every day. And so when I do it, when I'm super um, present with whatever I'm feeling, if I honor it, if I face it, if I talk to it, if I love it, then it kind of goes away to a safer place. And I don't carry it with me the next morning. It doesn't start my day with me the next morning. It is in a safe place, but the pockets start to empty. And, and it's really important that you do that in whether you are doing this work, whether you are walking in the steps of grief, which takes years and years, it's heavy work. Um, you have to take care of yourself. And most importantly, I think that you have to let people know that you are, you know, we always say, oh, I'm fine. No, you're not fine. And that's okay. 
it, you know, I want to validate that whatever you're feeling is real. Those are your feelings. You don't owe anyone an explanation or an apology for feeling overwhelmed or tired or sad. Be honest with it and find someone to talk to because chances are you are not alone. And, and I can guarantee you that there are people out there that want to make sure that you are not alone and, and ask for help and admit that you are fragile because you are not alone. Absolutely. And, and I know um, without COVID, this kind of care is a lot um, to do on a daily basis. And, and with COVID in particular, um, it made it that much more difficult um, for for staff, um, I know you work as part of our team, um, and and for the patients and families. Can you share, as difficult as it was, some you know a story or the the memory making of working with a patient or family during that time, even with masks, even with you know. It wasn't easy. Um... Of course. And I don't mean to sugarcoat it by any means by positioning that question. So please say whatever you, you'd like to around that. All right. Well, I'm not really good at sugarcoating anyway. So you <laughs> the bold truth. Um, you know what? At, at first, and I'll, I, I will probably cry again, but um, at first it was really difficult because we were providing end of life care, something that we do with our whole hearts to someone who is dying and their families couldn't be with them. I, I had to walk through, you know, plastic sheets covering doors and, and look at families standing outside windows. And here I am sitting with their families and there is this sense of guilt that I'd never experienced before. I shouldn't have been the one sitting there. And that was really hard for me. And at first, you know, we couldn't hug, we couldn't touch, everything was covered up. And, and it felt like a giant concrete wall between me and that person that is lying in the bed. And I, I felt so much fear, right? Because there was so much uncertainty and so much unknown. And I, I didn't want to touch them. And I, but I wanted to touch them so bad. And I was so conflicted. And so for the first many months, it was very hard. And it was very painful for me to watch families um, not be present for someone they love. So I, I then started finding ways, um, you know, things that I could do that could maybe change the, the, the weight of these situations. I, I still touched them with my gloves. I realized that was okay. I still, I did a couple elbow bumps and, and made the elbow <laughs> bump the new hug, you know, and, and air hugs. And, and I tried to be creative in that regard. But the thing that I also did was I encouraged FaceTime calls, which I think all of us in this field did, um, and really made um, the person on the other side of the phone feel very much there. I would share the facial expressions. I would say, oh, you should see him. He's so much calmer now because of you. Your voice did this, you know, and, um, and I, I really connected. Um, there was two times where I had um, a husband in the bed and the wife that was not able to see him. And I, I have these little red hearts, like I said, I collect hearts and I would bring the heart with me to the visit with the patient and I would put it in his hand and I would hold it, his hand wrapped around the heart for as long as my visit was there. And then when the, the wife who was, this is twice two different women um, were sitting in the lobby of the facility. This was at a facility and I handed her the heart after so that she knew that what she was touching was the last thing he touched and and so that she could have that heart and I did things like that um, often which was to try to help the situation be a little bit more compassionate but it was good for me too I I needed to know that somehow we were going to continue providing this beautiful care but we were gonna have to do it differently and it was gonna be okay. We were gonna do it well. And I believe that despite how hard it was on all of us, which it was, I think that we did pretty darn well considering. Yeah, that's... Very proud of our team for that. 
Well, and to continue to make memories for people and, and even more so to be the one who had the ability to be present in the same room with a loved one. Um, your role was even in some ways more significant, if you could even say that, um, in those times. And, and I just want to acknowledge and, and honor um, a lot of the public don't understand what healthcare professionals have to deal with emotionally themselves um, to do the work that that you do and in hospice care, especially with this pandemic. And, and I know um, the ability to care in that heart of, of hospice and the passion that you carry and our, our teams carry is, you, you know the intention, you know the difference and, and the creative workarounds that people had to do to, to be there. Um, so Gabby, as I before we open it up to the group, because I'm sure there are questions that people want to gain specific wisdom from you. Is there anything else that you would like to share a story or a reading from your book? Um, this is this is the new baby launch of your book today. So, um, you know, and and it, it the reviews have been pretty good. I think I'm I'm very proud of it. Um, Let's see. You know what? I think I'm going to read a story. Um, this, it, it's a lovely story about, uh, you know, it, one of the things that we do at Mission is the End of Life Option Act, which I respect anyone who does not support that. And that is not my purpose of sharing this story. Um, I am an advocate for it, but I also respect those who do not but I, I was given permission by the daughters of a patient to write this blog. And I, I think it depicts um, the work we do and, um, and what is important to me. And, um, and it's just a lovely story. So it is in the book, which you can see if you've, if you've read it or going to, but I'm gonna read it to you anyway. And it's called, I Will Say Farewell, Good Man. Working in end-of-life care has me questioning my own mortality often. I can't help but ask myself how much time I have left or, or if I have lived my life well, and what will my legacy be? I take pause almost daily and think about the people in my life, the ones I've already said goodbye to, the ones who I feel fierce love for now, and the ones I have yet to meet. I feel blessed all of the time, not so much for what I have, but for the life I have had the lessons I have learned, and despite the ob obstacles of which there have been many, the many joys I have felt in this oversized heart of mine. And while I cannot be certain how much time I might have left, I feel a sense of anticipation for so much more to come, and that excites me. But, but what if it doesn't? What if my time is cut short, and right now, today, and everything that led up to this day is all that I will ever have? Is that enough? Did I live my life well? And what does that actually mean to live your life well? I think it means fully appreciating it all, the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, the entirety and accumulation of your whole life. It doesn't mean it was all rosy and perfect. And at least for me, it isn't about wealth or things. I think it is about gratitude and grace. Another question I ask myself often is, am I being the best version of myself? Do you ever ask that of yourself? And if you do, or if you are, are only asking yourself this question now as you read my words, what is your answer? If this is all I will ever have, I will feel peace in my heart that despite it all, I have lived my life well, and I am being the best version of myself. Keep in mind that I am acknowledging daily that there is always room for growth, and I welcome that. I met a man recently who had made it to 101 years of life and his deteriorating condition was threatening to take away his very last bit of independence. With his clear mind, he already felt tortured by his nearly blind and immobile state, and he anticipated further weakening and debilitation, which would be unbearable for him to endure. He chose to exercise his right to take the end-of-life Option Act medications and end his life with dignity and on his terms. This is a man who lived his life well, and certainly from my perspective, but clearly from those who love him, he lived an exceptional life. It was an honor for me to meet him. Prior to taking these medications, he spoke with his family and shared his wishes. As you can imagine, this was not easy for them, but they love and respect him so much, they accepted his choice and didn't pass judgment. This does not mean that some of them didn't struggle with it, 
but they gathered around him like the beautiful family they are and let him know they supported him completely and would not let him do this alone. He also wrote a letter to his friends, of which there are many, saying his goodbye. He thanked them for their friendship, for all of the memories and for the part they played in making his life a good life. He was honest about his choice, not asking for their approval and not needing it either, but simply to share his truth with them, that he had lived his life well. He had had an exceptional life and he simply wanted to say thank you and goodbye. I was sitting with him at the kitchen table the day before he took the medications. He took a phone call from a friend. It was hard not to listen in. The call was on speakerphone and I was only a few feet away. In many ways, I felt as though it was intended for me to hear, not by his intention necessarily, perhaps just the magical way the universe works, because every word spoken, both from him and his friend, resonated deeply, and it increased my desire to move forward with an even more intense motivation to live the rest of my life fully and with appreciation for it all. At the end of the conversation, he said to his friend, I will say farewell, good man, and he hung up the phone. I felt a tear fall down my cheek in the slowest of motion and I thought to myself, this is a man who loved his life, his family and his friends fiercely. I knew that all who loved him were going to miss him. His honesty with his family and friends about his decision touched me, but so did the profound awareness he had in his last hours of the true depth of love felt by everyone in his life. I think there might have been some uncertainty for him all these years and the outpouring of love in response to his letter allowed him to see himself in a brighter light. He was a humble man that seemed to doubt the compliments handed him and perhaps it was those last few days that offered him the chance to finally believe it to be true. The day he took his medications, he was asked moments before, what has meant most to him in his life of 101 years? He answered the question something like this, I have lived my life well, and what has mattered most was the love I have felt for family and friends. And the room went silent, all knowing they were each a part of what filled his heart to the rim. I looked around at this beautiful family who were about to say goodbye to someone they had loved all of their lives, each of them silently clinging tightly to the year's worth of special moments they were remembering of times well spent and lessons learned. I was witnessing deep love a moment I shall hold in my heart forever. Having the chance to say goodbye to him, to thank him and to express their love and gratitude was a blessing, one which I am sure comforts them. It is also another reminder for me to be sure to take advantage of those moments to say the things to my family and to my friends now so they always know how deeply loved they are. I will say farewell, good man. You lived your life well and you will leave behind hearts that feel incredibly full and a legacy that raises the bar. Hmm. You know, it's this is a good example of one of the things I say often, which is to say the things. You only get one chance at this life. This is it. And I see so much regret at the bedside. I see people like filling this last few moments with all the stuff they've wanted to say, whether it's it's regret or thanks or, or forgiveness or any of those things in between. But what if you make a practice to say them now, to maybe let go of some of the anger, maybe do a little more forgiving, maybe try to resolve issues or let things go so that when it comes time to sit at the bedside and say goodbye to someone you love, that you know in your heart, they knew all the things and that they knew that you loved them and that they mattered. But to live your life fully first allows you to find a little bit more peace and comfort in those moments before you say goodbye. And I, I truly believe that. I, I think that we need to embrace the life that we have right now um, because we cannot be certain of tomorrow, right? This is all we can be certain of. And if we wake up tomorrow, well, that's a bonus day. But <laughs> what if we made sure that today, the people in our life, friends or family, that they knew how much they mattered? And then tomorrow, eh, we can say it again, but at least we always said it today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so many things going on in the world that would only be a better place if more of us did that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So 
Wonderful, Gabby, with the wisdom and this new book and what you've shared so far. I, I would love, and I know you would love to hear what people, what what's moving you, what questions might you have. Um, we can take questions in the chat to start or uh, depending on how many there are, you can raise your hand if um, you know how to do that on the bottom of your screen. There's a reaction area and you can um, raise your hand to ask Gabby a question. Or if you wanna share something or say something. I think Bethany. Yes, your wonderful colleagues is incredible work, Gabby, so moving. Thank you. We're putting people on the spot when everyone's in this really beautiful emotional hug that you have created by sharing your stories. I can read something else if that's okay. Please do. Oh, wait, oh. somebody has a question. Yay. Yes. I did the little hand emoji, but I think it blends into my background. It does. Um, Sorry, I didn't see that. Um, no worries at all. In the last hour, you have impacted. I can see it on everyone's faces, all of our hearts. So thank you so much for your words. Um, everyone is very moved, I can tell. Let me look at my question really quick. Um, I loved your, your heart story because my family collects marbles. Mm. And I feel like once you're looking for something, you see it everywhere. So I also tend to see like hearts and marbles everywhere I'm at. And my question for you is in scenarios where loved ones don't get to say goodbye, what methods do you recommend for them to get that closure throughout their grieving process? That's an excellent question. Um, I, I teach some classes, some of you may know. One of them is once a month, I hold a ritual and ceremony class. And this class is I, the first portion of it, I share some of the rituals um, and ceremonies that I do for patients and for people who are grieving. But at the end, I do, a, 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 I call it the tea light candle ceremony, but it has a, a lot of different themes to it. And one of which is for people who haven't had a chance to say goodbye. And I do this ceremony where we light the candle and you send them all the messages you wanna send, whether it's goodbye, I love you, I miss you, or maybe just to share something that is really important that you send to them. And we light, and we light the candle before we do that. And the idea is through the ceremony that I do, that when we blow out the candle, the message is, is sent and received. So I, I tr that's, a, um, that's very difficult when someone has not had a chance to say goodbye because that means there isn't any closure for them and people need a chance to say goodbye. So I'm always trying to create some sort of ritual or ceremony for them that they can do with me at first and then they can do on their own and, 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 and mold it in a way that works best for them. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anybody else have a question or something they want to share or say? Kate. Hey. Yeah. So four years ago, uh, you were there for me while my husband was dying. And um, one of my most vivid memories of our interaction was um, I was very nervous. Uh, it, it was a very, he comes from a very communal culture where, so lots of people were coming by to say goodbye. And I wanted to be alone with him or with him and my children at the moment of death. And I remember saying to you, Gabby, what do I do? There's all these people out in the living room who, who want to say goodbye. And you said, don't worry, Kate, I'm going to take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> we had a very uh, intimate, private time together, my kids and I and my husband, but there were, I don't know, 15 people out in the living room. And, I, and since I've been in that situation where I've tried to help a friend with when they want to be alone with their loved one, but there are a lot of people who want to be there too. What, what tool do you use at that moment? Um, honest, I, I truly honor the patient's wishes first. If there is something that they want said or done, I will do that. But then with the family, like in your particular case, there were so many people and they love him fiercely, right? And you can appreciate that. But what I did was I went out and I said, you guys, um, he's getting very close 
and and Kate and the family really need to just spend some quiet time with him now. You know, if you could allow them that, if there is time later, um, perhaps you can have another opportunity, but I, I think it's really important that they have these last few moments. And everyone was super supportive because I think people don't know what to do. I think everyone assumes they should all fill a room, but that's a lot of energy for the person who is dying and for the person who's saying goodbye. Less is definitely more in this situation. So I, I try to let them know that all of that energy in the room is a lot for them to absorb. And, and so I just ask them to just give you some privacy. And it worked. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. If anyone has a question about um, how a hospice nurse or doula can benefit the end of life process, I think this has been an extraordinary offering to, to share with the difference that that, that that can make, including uh, what you just shared with Kate and her family. It's very hard for people to speak up for themselves in that moment, but to have someone else come out and kind of state the obvious can calm everyone and offer that space. So um, it's essential that you were there in that, that moment um, to provide that space. I think it's important to do that, to um, really respect the wishes of someone who is dying and someone who's saying goodbye. And, and if we have the opportunity to help them in that way, I think it's really important that we do it. Wonderful, lots of, lots of nodding heads. Um, I know you have more that you can read. Are there any other questions or stories to share at this moment or we wanna hear more from Gabby? Okay, I'm gonna okay. share. I'm gonna share some more. Great. All right. First, I would like to say, I think that Francis is on the uh, call. Frances is an incredible photographer. She does a lot of work, um, not just photography work, but for mission. And she is part of our hospice team. And she is the responsible party for the cover. She, this is her photo. And I, I do thank her. And in the, in the front of the book, I acknowledge her and I send you a link to her website, which is amazing. She's got some beautiful photos. So I, I just want to say that this book is beautiful, partly because of her as well. Um, okay, I'm going to read something to you guys. This is an, an, I think that I've, I've decided that I'm going to become a poet. Um, I, on the first page of this book, I, I wrote a poem. And, um, and it's the only place that you can see it. I've never shared it anywhere else. So if you've not gotten the book, then you've never heard it. It's called When That Last Breath Is Taken. Those moments at the bedside just before someone dies, the last things you hear, the silence and the cries. There's ache that people feel before having to say goodbye, all the things they wanna say, but all they can do is cry. As a hospice nurse, I struggle to find the perfect words to say. I want to guide those at the bedside, the ones who wait day after day. I want to help them with their final words, the last words that they might say. I encourage them to say the things to feel and to pray. I believe that people hear every word that is being said, even when they are lying unresponsive in their bed. It is best to say those important things way before the end is near, but any chance to say them, it is important for them to hear. When that last breath is taken and you've said your last goodbye, the ribbons of your words are a gift that can never be untied. Hold in your heart forever, you gave them the very best farewell and tucked deep inside your heart is the reminder that you loved them well. I think you are a poet. You're not going to be a poet. <laughs> well, I'm Dr. Seuss with a hospice nurse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's face it, it's Dr. Seuss. <laughs> no, no, you're getting... You're getting dis dissent on that comment. Um, <laughs> so I know, Gabby, that you also do workshops. Mm. And, um, and I'm curious how you've mentioned some through your stories and your, your experiences shared, but how does doing this work change your life or how do you... Um, how have you experienced 
having people face the end of their lives, whether in workshops or in reality, um, but especially prior to death, um, facing your own mortality or living with doing the work, how does that change you? Oh, um, I think that, you know, people always say, how, how, how can you live with seeing so much death? The truth is what I see, yes, I see death, but I see life, I see love, I see culture, I see tradition, I see faith. Oh, I am so overwhelmed by the different types of cultural and tradition and faiths that I get to witness. It fills me up. It, um, I think what this work does is it reminds me to live, like I had said earlier about, um, I'm, I'm very childlike with my excitement about each day because I duly, I duly, I truly understand how precious and fragile it is. And, and this work that I do, I want to share these stories with people who to tend not want to hear because it makes them sad and and I get that, but what I guess what I want to try to tell them is, but there's life, you know, I want them to see the beauty that I see. So that dark cloud around death isn't so prominent all the time. It's inevitable. We are all going to die. And, and this is our, our one life. So what I see is, is the reminder to live my life better and fuller and with a little bit of fierceness and play because I, I want to have fun. I want to laugh. I want to love deeply and I want to be loved deeply. And all of those things are so important. And, and I get to witness that every day. And in my workshops, um, most of what I do, I teach um, from a hospice nurse and a doula end of life doula perspective, I've combined them. And my classes, I have a seven week class, which I I, what I do is I get you to thinking your, your time is limited and I help you to determine how you want to be cared for when you, when you die, who you want there, what you want done, all of that stuff. But each week we go into that and, and it's twofold. On one point, it's you knowing what you want so that you can tell your family so they can have an idea of what it is that you want. The other part of it is maybe the reminder to live your life a little more fuller and for people who are doing this work to do it better. Because at the end of the day, my complete goal, whether it's with teaching or with this book, is to inspire people to do this work, maybe not be so afraid of it, but also to, to improve the way we care for people who are dying. Because I think we can do it better. I think we do it well. But consistently, globally, I think we can do it better. And I want to be a part of that. Wonderful. You're getting a lot of kudos in the comment sections. Um, uh, thank you for sharing your grace and wisdom. So calming and beautiful to hear your reflection and stories. Thank you. And you have a question um, aligned to what you just said about inspiring more people to do this work. What advice do you have? to make a hospice room more comfortable in a hospital style setting for the patient and families? And can you share what's required to become a doula? So those are two separate questions, but starting with a hospice room, how do you make a hospital feeling room more comfortable for a patient? So I want you to imagine the senses, right? What we see, what we hear, what we taste, what we feel, all of those senses. Now imagine you're lying in a hospital bed. What do you see? What do you hear? Is your mouth dry? Do you, do you want some watermelon or strawberries? Do you want to see flowers in a vase? Are all the pictures of your loved ones to the right of you on a table that you can't see? What if we move them in front of you? What if we open the curtains? What if we put artwork on your walls? What if we, we think about the things that you can see and feel and hear and, and be mindful of things like, for instance, um, you know, people always, I'm probably going to make some people mad here, people always put those scent diffusers in, in rooms, right, which is nice if you like that, but what if 
they don't like that. Like I do not want a diffuser in my room. I love the smell of lavender in little doses. I, I even love like, I have this air freshener that I put in my bathroom, which is really so, kind of soft and, and vanilla-ish, but I don't want that at my bedside either. So really be mindful of things, you know, and, and that is why I really encourage the conversation ahead of time. Talk about death. It's okay to talk about death. It's not going to, talking about death isn't going to speed it up. You know, it's not going to suddenly make it happen faster because you had a conversation about it. But what if you shared all these things with the people that you love that said something to the effect of, I would like this music played. I would like to have all of my family in frame photos where I can see them. I want the bed moved so I can look out the window and I want cold water all the time. Now, what if you knew that ahead of time and you were able to provide that for your, for your loved one? Now we had a, a patient at the hospice house once and this is one of my, my, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, favorite patients. She was <laughs> with us for quite some time and she was an artist and her husband tied strings all around the room and all of the cards that came, he hung them up because he wanted her to always see them. Well, she taught art classes as well and her students kept sending her all these beautiful pictures. So he hung them from each of the, the, the strings and, and I got her some iridescent butterflies on strings and we hung them from her windows and, and we got her um, cherry blossom branches and filled the vases so she could see them all the time. And, and we just turned her room into a place that was joy instead of the reminder of what was happening next. So I would say what to do to the room, bring your love into the room, make the view a little prettier. Make sure she, he or she has a, a blanket that, that they love, a pillow that is soft, things that they see and smell and touch and hear that it's kind and compassionate and beautiful and, and, and bring some comforts of home so that they feel a little less stark and sterile. And in answer to the question about the doula, there are a lot of programs out there. You can take the two day ones, they're less expensive, they're quick, and I'm probably not gonna make people happy about this, but that is not gonna make you a doula. Um, I, it'll give you a certificate. Um, if you're not doing this work yet, I would encourage you to become a hospice volunteer because in my opinion, the hospice volunteers are doulas. The work they do is so incredibly beautiful. It is unselfish, it is, um, kind, it is compassionate, and they, they understand the word presence better than most. And, and they do this beautiful work, which is that which a doula does. I took a, a very lengthy program that was probably a little bit more pricey, but because I did it for many reasons. One, I liked what they had to offer, but also I wanted something more than I had already learned as a hospice nurse. So my program was longer. It was almost nine months, and it was deep, incredibly deep. And, and I, I take some of what I learned and I put it into my program that I teach, which if you wanna become a doula, that class that I teach is really good for that. Um, there are a couple, Conscious Dying Institute is where I went. There are two doulas um, in addition who I think are wonderful. Deanna Cochran is amazing. Francesca Arnoldi is amazing. If you just Google them and, and you can find their programs. But you really want to do something, if you've never done this work and you've suddenly decided that you want to become a doula, take a deeper, more in-depth, more spiritual dive into the doula program because that's what you want when you're sitting at the bedside and, and become a hospice volunteer because you're going to learn stuff in that, their training that um, will make you a better human. Yeah, I'm just going to give a, a bit of a plug there as well for not all hospice volunteer trainings are the same either. And we have a phenomenal one at Mission Hospice um, and some are online. And I think it's similar to any training you get what you invest and, and how present if you want to learn presence, it's nice to have people present to learn that with. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure that was very helpful. And the question was also, do you have to be a nurse to be a doula? No, not at all. In fact, you don't have to have any experience whatsoever. What you have to have is the uh, compassionate heart and the willingness to sit at a bedside of someone who is dying with no need to say anything sometimes, definitely no need to fix. It's all about holding space for someone, for showing up for them, 
um, for meeting them in their space and, and just being present for them in a way that reminds them they aren't alone and, and that they are supported and cared for well. And I think anyone can do that. And so no, you do not have to be a nurse, but it's really important to know that as a doula, you do not, just because I'm a nurse doesn't mean I get to use those skills and, and the things that I come with, my tools um, as a doula. So when I'm a, a doula, if I have a, a patient that I'm a doula for, I and they have a hospice team, I respect that hospice team. I am not a nurse. I don't give medication. I don't advise about medication. I, I educate if I can, and I always encourage them to go to their team because I, I have to know my role and my boundaries. So no, you don't have to be a nurse, but you also need to know that they are two separate things. A doula is a companion. Um, I consider myself as sort of the, uh, uh, as a doula, I'm a choreographer of a, a beautiful, a lovelier death. And, and I, so I choreograph with the patient and family to ensure that their wishes are honored. So I like to think of myself as sort of a, a death liaison uh, or a choreographer, but really you're a companion, a, a compassionate companion. Right, and, and as you were saying that, I was hearing Leonard Cohen's line, dance me to the end of life as your choreography. Oh, I love uh, that, I love that. <laughs> um, Another question here, would you provide some recommendations how best to be present and comfort a friend who has lost a loved one? So I think it's really important. Um, the most important thing, and I, I, I say this often, is to listen. Listen to someone with the intention of hearing them and letting them know they've been heard. Because we tend to sit with someone, right? We're going to offer to be there for them, and then they'll start talking. And then we, we most people have this, uh, this need to suddenly share their own story. Or, oh, this happened to me once, and this is how I handled it. But when someone is grieving especially, listen to them. And, and maybe ask them, what do you need from me? How can I help you? And if they just want to talk, just listen. And being present, what that means is to remember that this is not about you. And when you go into the space of someone else, you leave your stuff behind. You, you turn off your watch, your phone, your social media, all of that stuff that distracts us. And I always take a pause at the door before I ever go in and I leave that stuff there because their experience, their moment, their, their death or their grief is theirs. And the only way you can truly honor that is to say, I hear you and, and to be fully present for them and listen with no intention whatsoever of fixing or even having an opinion. They don't need that. What they need to know is that you hear them. And with relative to grieving, another thing that I think is really important is to remember that someone doesn't stop grieving because time has passed. You don't stop loving someone who has died. In fact, the grief goes on forever. Every anniversary, every holiday, every event that has something to do with them, every time they open a photo album or hear a song or make coffee for breakfast, everything they do for the rest of their life is going to remind them of someone they love that they had to say goodbye to. So please, too, never say things like, isn't it time you're over that? Or gosh, you should be feeling better about now. Instead, just check in, always check in, don't stop. Don't stop after those few weeks when the food stops showing up and all the cards have sort of faded and, and all of a sudden there's only two or three people that's reaching out. They need you more then than they did the first day. Keep reaching out, keep checking in. And you don't have to say things like, how are you? I mean, how do you think they are? Just say something like I'm checking in and I'm here if you need me. Do you wanna go for a walk? Do you wanna talk about them? Let's talk about him because he's right there. He's always going to be there for them. And of course they want to talk to him about him, right? Who wouldn't? Let them share and listen. Might be your next book on grieving. <laughs> We'll let you we'll let you go talk about this one some more first. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Absolutely. Lot of work. 
it's a lot of work and you you put your heart and your soul and your wisdom and honored so many people's stories and experiences through that gabby thank you so much for sharing that with all of us um you want to open up if there are other questions or comments for gabby we've got um just a bit of time left together come on you guys i want to hear from you All right, then I'm gonna have to read something else. I think that's what they might be wanting. Okay, let's see here. Hmm. I tried to tab a bunch of stuff. Okay, with each thing I wrote in the book, each blog, each um, story, everything that I wrote in here, I, at the end of each one, I wrote a little thing that says my advice. So if I shared a blog, I would say, you know, put a little advice, like sort of advice to you, how, how I would suggest you move forward with something. Well, on, uh, at the end of the book, I, I write this thing, one thing that says my advice, and this is for being with someone who is dying. Be fully present, show up, earn their trust, Listen with the intent to hear, not to fix. Do not judge. Do not speak over them or interrupt them. Never give them the impression that you are too busy for them. Ask them what they need. Be gentle with your words, your touch, and your voice. Um, one of the ones on here that is really important is um, that never give them the impression that you are too busy for them. I want you to, to imagine someone is lying in the bed and they do not have a voice, like I've mentioned before, and they're lying there and, and, and they're, they know that you're there, but they can't say how they feel. And let's say you are on your phone. You know, our phones have just taken away such an intimate part of being present. And you're sitting at the phone and you're going like this. That is what they hear. But what they are hearing is, I'm too busy to sit here with you and just be with you. I have so many other things that are far more important. Remember that, because that's what they hear. They hear everything. And if you're talking to someone in, you know, in the room, but you're whispering, they hear the whispering. Don't whisper. Leave the room if you've got something to say or involve them. Always assume they hear. Don't drag a chair across the floor, pick it up. And when you walk into the room and you see them there, announce yourself, not at the top of your lungs and pound on the door, simply go, hey, Joe, it's me, I'm here. And let them know you're there. And before you touch them, you put your hand down on the bed and say, hey, it's me, I've got you. I'm gonna take your hand here for a minute or I'm gonna sit next to your bed. And um, just remember that they hear everything. And I, I believe that and, and they know when, you know, they know when you're there and when you're not there, even when you're there. So, so be mindful of that. And we know when people aren't there, when they're there, when we're living, yeah, exactly. <laughs> probably even more sensitive to that when you're dying and, and in a bed. Yeah. Can you share another one, Gabby? Okay. I don't mind you. I could do this all day. <laughs> um, okay, so you know, I, I, I've mentioned this before, um, about my feelings about medication, and I think I want to clear, make sure that this is clear. I think medication is very important. And I think that in many cases, it is absolutely necessary. I, I would just like to not have it always be the first thing that people go to, um, and count on to relieve symptoms. And so in everything I write, I am constantly putting out there what I feel about it. So I wrote one, um, a blog about medication and pain. Um, and this might be a good tool as well. During my course to become an end of life doula, we had an assignment to sit down with three people and discuss their last few months. I started each conversation asking them how they wanted to die, which immediately went to pain. I find that most people equate pain with death. And while yes, there can be pain at the end of life, it is usually due to the progression of the illness and not necessarily the dying process. Each person said that they wanted to be sure that they were not in pain and I can appreciate this. 
There are definitely signs to observe to indicate whether someone might be in pain, facial grimacing, moaning, increased heart rate, and verbal statements of pain. I believe that the medications we use in end of life can be effective and are many times absolutely necessary. But I also believe that some things can be relieved with positioning or verbal and or tactile stimuli. I have also found that moaning does not always indicate physical pain and administering medication in hopes to reduce it might not be effective. Sometimes that person who is lying in the bed dying is struggling with emotional pain, perhaps some fear or regret, sadness and everything else in between. My brain always goes to, what if I can comfort him enough to reduce the emotional pain somehow? And so I try. I am not a doctor and I'm not speaking for everyone else. This is just the way that I do things and the way I provide comfort and care to people who are dying. I believe they hear everything we say and I've witnessed a change in conditions simply by holding a hand and letting them know that they are not alone. I like to try these things before administering medication. If I am unable to relieve them, I will use the medications that have been ordered, even asking the doctors for increases if necessary, because at the end of the day, I want to make sure that their landing is soft and they do not struggle or suffer and that whatever it takes, I am open to. I just don't rush or push the medications immediately. I believe that education is key in all areas of end of life care, but especially relative to medication. Medications scare people and the thought of administering it to someone they love can be terrifying and can result in a feeling of guilt that doesn't go away. I never want to know that I have left someone feeling that way. So something I practice often is educating about the medications we encourage someone to give. If you explain to the wife of a man who is dying that the amount of medication we suggest she give him is not enough to end his life and we are not in the business of hastening death, she will feel less fear. It is important that we let her know that we are suggesting that what we are suggesting is just enough to calm his struggle and hopefully bring him some peace. If you've read my previous blogs or books, you've heard me say things like lorazepam and morphine are very good friends. They play nicely together. I, I say this because I want to leave people feeling comfortable at the, at the very least less fearful when it comes to giving medications that could, best case scenario, very quickly reduce suffering. Could someone die after be given the amount of morphine we suggest? Yes but more than likely it is because that medication reduced the distress enough to allow them to succumb to their dying process a little more peacefully, allowing the body to shut down in a kinder, gentler way. The dying process can be unpredictable and most times it is peaceful and even beautiful, but sometimes it is difficult and painful to watch. If we can prepare a family for either scenario, if we are completely honest with them about everything, then there will be less surprises and fear. I uh, wrote that blog a long time ago and I received an email from a, a gentleman who said that his husband had died a few years before and, and he, the hospice people told him to give morphine. He gave morphine a few times and then his husband passed away. And he has carried this guilt with him that he did that. And he said, he said, Gabby, I need to ask you, did I kill my husband? And I said, no, I mean, I wasn't there, but no, the illness ended the life. The morphine or whatever it was that you gave him just allowed him to succumb to the process without the distress of the suffering he was probably experiencing. And once given that permission to let go, they succumb to what is already happening just in a kinder and gentler way. And, and he, he said, after that, he sent me an email saying, I wish someone would have told me that sooner. That's a lot of time for someone to carry that guilt and weight with them. And, and if we could just take a little longer in our visits uh, with these teams and, and say to them, you know, this is some information about these medications. This is how all of them work. This is what could happen, good and bad. You know, more is not always better. Sometimes too much pain medication can make pain worse. Be mindful of that. And, and symptoms and things that people go through at the end of life, if you educate them, if you tell them what's going on, the fear is reduced. I truly believe that. It's not gonna change the dynamic or how it happens. Like it's not gonna change the end result. But could the landing be softer? Yes. And that is our goal. Beautiful. And there, there are so many myths and misconceptions um, about so many things that can be made simpler with that kind of 
loving education, um, both about medications and also the guilt and regret people live with after the fact. So um, this this work and the messages that you are sharing are are for the living and those who are dying. We have a new question. Right. Yes, this is Randy. I just wanted to kind of make a comment. I lost my mom, unfortunately, a week ago today and had to go through that process of the medication. And it started with, I had caregivers around the clock and I had one caregiver in particular that loved her so deeply that she didn't want to really give her medications unless she needed it until she was asking and she was in pain. And it kind of got to the point where I kind of had to put my foot down and said, you know, as much as I love that you don't want to give it to her, she needs that to get through the day. And I don't want to get behind the eight ball when she's in pain, because then we're waiting another 30 minutes for the stuff to kick in. And we, we kept changing the, the frequencies and dosages of, of the medication and finally came to a point where she, we were at the right level. And then of course, finally she passed. So I felt really good about the fact that we kind of slowly increased the dosages to make it to, like you said, to the point where she felt comfortable and that she could go into that other space, not feeling any more pain. Mm. And so I can totally relate to what you're talking about and about how that gentleman had said, did I kill my husband? Because, you know, you don't want to be the, have the guilt of, of if, is it the medicine or is it the actual illness that caused their death? And I honestly believe that we did the right thing and, and, and in relationship to something you said beforehand in terms of, you know, visiting and, and not talking around, <laughs> around the patient when, when they're lying in bed and you don't know if they're hearing you or not hearing you. And I just know she was there and listening to everything that we were saying. And it, it was just this whole, this whole thing you're doing today is really wonderful. And I just have to tell you how much I appreciate that you're doing this. Oh, thank you so much. And you did really wonderful work for your mom. I mean, gosh, bless you. And caregivers, bless their heart. You know, they, they do struggle with that, especially ones who've been with someone for quite some time. And their immediate reaction is to, to fill them up with lots of food and liquids and, and keep that going as though it might, you know, keep them alive longer when the, the truth is it actually causes a little more difficulty for them. And I think that that education is really good for someone like you, of course, because this is your mother, but I think caregivers need to know it too. And one of the things that I do, I just have so much respect for caregivers because they're the ones that are so up close and personal, right? They spend so much time with these people. And so they, they deserve the training and the education too. And what I have learned to do is not tell them, stop feeding, stop this. I say things like, instead of this, do this. It's going to bring them more comfort. And I give them some tools too. And when it comes to medication, I reassure them. I say, this is what, you know, this, first of all, we call them things like morphine and methadone, which of course have such negative con connotations to them. And of course, people are afraid. But if you take the time to explain to them the why and what this medication is for and what that person might be going through, there is a little less fear and a little less hesitation to give. Um, but you, you did wonderful work. You should know that. Thank you. Well, Gabby, I think you've, you've managed to answer the last question um, in that as well. It was about um, when people want to keep feeding a family member. Um, and and I, I love the example of instead of this, do that. Um, you know, I think um, something that to be really mindful of is in age, but also in the dying process, um, you know, our ability to swallow is affected. And sometimes someone will not realize that until they have food in their mouth. And if you're already going through a dying process, this is the end of your life, and then you choke. And I don't mean to be so harsh with the words I'm using, but the truth is that's what it is. It is choking to death and it is, it is horrible. And it is not bringing them comfort to give them food and water when they are struggling with just even breathing. And so it's really important to know that when someone is going through the dying process, when they are you know, down to their last weeks or days, what's comforting is your voice and your presence 
um, to be clean and well cared for physically, to have uh, uh, the pillows, I call it a hug. Like I always put the pillows in a way that hugs them so that they're cozy. And to think of, of people who are dying almost like small children, you know, babies who need to be wrapped tightly and, and cared for well because there's this sense of fear. All of those things, all of that kind of care is better than food and water. It, it could cause them more distress. It will be uncomfortable for them. And many times people accept the food and water because they don't want to let you down. And so they will take a bite of food because you're, come on, one more bite. But that one more bite could really cause them some struggle. So you're not starving them. You are not hurting them by not giving them food or water in the last days. If they are not able to look at you and say, yes, I want some, then, then just know that it's okay. You're not hurting them. Well, Gabby, you have from uh, the in initial senses and tips for people, caregivers at the bedside to your own stories and experiences through COVID before and now after and, and the, the fundamental message that comes through loud and clear is about love. And, and I know that that's where your, your heart and where your new book at the bedside um, is sharing more and more to more people who are caregivers, professional and otherwise. Um, as we close and we're, we're one minute over already, but I just wanted to give you the last word of, of how you would like to leave us all this afternoon. Well, first, I wanna say thank you for being here. Um, I appreciate all of you more than you know. Um, and I think the last thing I wanna say to you is to, um, to be kind to yourself and to others and to say the things, say them today, reach out to someone you haven't talked to in a while, give them a call, send them a letter, let them know that they matter and, and live your life a little bit more um, fiercely and, and give yourself permission to have fun and, and to know that today is all we can be certain of. So live it well. Well, on behalf of everyone who is here, the applause, the virtual hugs, um, I for one am grateful that you are serving so many at the bedside and now through your, your work in writing and workshops and um, the comments are saying the same. Thank you, what a blessing this has been. So Gabby, from all of us um, to all those whose lives your work has touched and will continue to, thank you. And for those of you participating, um, we will be sending out a follow-up survey. Um, would love your feedback, and we will share that with Gabby as well. And um, her book, At the Bedside, can be found on Amazon. And her blog, um, Gabby, I don't have it in front of me, so if you would just let everyone know your blog so that they can find you. The blog is www.thehospiceheart.net, and that blog has everything, the books, the classes, um, and an email if you want to say hi, um, and I'd love to hear from you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and wisdom, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>